Hi there. And welcome to another firsty on my Nostalgia Trip games. This time we're going to take a look at the first five games for... Nintendo 64. I don't know if you can see the logo there, but there it is. This massive beast of a, of a console was never really that big a part of my youth. Because it came in such a late time in my childhood. Well, I must have been 18 by the time it got... No, I was 17, I think, when, when the N64 was introduced. Not sure, though. So, I only have like a handful of games for it. Which I got with the console as I purchased it from my friend Sami. Thanks again for uh, letting me buy that thing from you. <laughs> but yeah, here we go. The first five games for the Nintendo 64. Most of the Nintendo fans I'm aware of have usually bought any Nintendo console for either a Mario game or a Zelda game, but the Nintendo 64 had something else going on for it. Everyone I knew who had a Nintendo 64 were hyping on more about one particular game over anything Mario related, and that was GoldenEye. Up until that point, games based on Ian Fleming's undying James Bond franchise had ranged from awful to passable, with Parker Brothers' arcade game probably being the most overall playable of the lot. GoldenEye was the first of a new era, after Domark thankfully no longer had the sole rights to make James Bond games. The previous film and game, License to Kill, was made in 1989, which was made for the previous two generations of home computers. Pierce Brosnan's entrance as 007 happened in 1995, so the game was two years late for the market. But since the game was a first-person shooter, it was only logical to wait a bit until some better hardware came along to allow for a home console to perform well enough to make the concept playable enough. GoldenEye on the Nintendo 64 follows the movie rather well and brought some new highly sought-after life into Bond games, which in turn made the console itself more attractive for more serious gamers to consider buying. The biggest attraction to this game, however, is the multiplayer mode, in which you can battle with four players against each other in a split-screen view, which was something unique and amazing back then, if a bit too uncomfortable for smaller screens. Personally, I never was a fan of playing first-person shooters on a pad, having gotten used to a keyboard and mouse combination after Quake on the PC, so the controls can't help but feel awkward to me. But still, I think the game is well-designed particularly considering the console. However, the original hasn't aged too well, so the official Wii remake from 2010 was very welcome indeed. Mind you, the graphics weren't all that nice to begin with. But if you have to own one first-person shooter for the Nintendo 64, this is it. One of the more groundbreaking 3D games on the previous Nintendo was the semi-rail-based space shooter Star Fox, or Star Wing as it was called here in Europe, and at the time the first official sequel was to be released no earlier than on the Nintendo 64. Imaginatively titled Star Fox 64, which was at least released as Lilat Wars here in Europe, no doubt for German-related purposes, was considered as a reboot of the series, which to Nintendo's mind included the unreleased Star Fox 2, but for us gamers it was more of a remake of the only game we knew of. Of course, now that Star Fox 2 has finally been released with the Super NES Classic Edition as an unlockable game, Lilat Wars can be finally considered a reboot since it incorporates elements from both Star Fox games on the Super Nintendo including three new game modes from Star Fox 2 and land-based vehicles. Naturally, with the N64 architecture, Lilat Wars features multiplayer support up to four players simultaneously, with three multiplayer game modes to have fun with. 
For added purchase incentive, this was the first N64 game to support the Rumble Pack, a force feedback add-on device of sorts, and the first releases had them bundled in with the game. Star Fox 64 Lilith Wars is definitely one of the higher points in the Nintendo 64 release catalog and should be experienced on a real Nintendo 64 as intended. The only puzzle game I currently have for the Nintendo 64 is Wet Tricks, published originally for the N64 by the American branch of Ocean Software before getting ported to Windows PCs, Dreamcast and Game Boy. I learned of this game in the early 2000s when the PC version of the game was released in Europe. We were kind of late in that respect and got to play it on Windows. Ever since learning about Wetrix, it always intrigued me, not least because Ocean, which was one of my old favorite software houses, published it as one of their last games before getting merged with Infogrames. But being a puzzle game fan, the concept also felt like a fresh twist into what was supposedly a form of Tetris, building frames for small lakes and trying not to drown or destroy the small floating platform while at it. I never got very good at it, but after finally getting the original Nintendo 64 version into my collection, I've been revisiting it more often than before. I can't say it's highly recommendable, but puzzle fans might enjoy it as a very unique experience. Well, of course, we need to have one racing game on the list, so I'll choose the first one that I played on the Nintendo 64, Wave Race. This was the first sequel to water-based racing game that began its life on the Nintendo Game Boy. Water-based racing games have always been an anomaly, although they have existed since the early 80s. Wave Race! I would hazard an educated guess and say that the main reason for this has most likely been the fact that getting the interaction between water and water-based motor vehicles realistic is quite a bit more difficult than anything land-based. But Wave Race on the Nintendo 64 is, from what I can remember, the first good example of jet ski action in a computer or video game, and still one of the only ones of that particular kind. Of course, what we have here on a more general level is not much more than Mario Kart on water in 3D, and you can't get it on any other platform than a Nintendo console. Happily, Wave Race 64 has also been released on more modern Nintendo consoles if you don't have an N64 account. We end this list with a game that inspired me the most from all the games I remember playing back in the day. Blast Core, another exclusive Nintendo 64 title from Rare, which was actually one of their first for the platform, is a fun little action puzzle game in which you demolish stuff to get a truck of explosive materials from point A to point B. Although that seems like a simple enough concept and the beginning of the game fools you into thinking that'll be a piece of cake, the game does get progressively more difficult, by necessitating different kinds of demolishing vehicles for you to be more effective in paving the way for the truck. Every now and then you will get training courses for each new demolishing vehicle, and after a certain amount of beginner levels you get to switch between different vehicles, and each vehicle has its own tricks of the trade to get better at demolishing. Being an isometrically viewed, properly three-dimensional game, Last Core harks back to Rare's old games from back when they were still called Ultimate Play the Game, so this can be considered a continuation of their tradition from Spectrum classics like Night Lord, Pentagram and Gunslinger, as well as NES classics like RC Pro-Am and Snake Rattle and Roll. Although Blast Corps wasn't designed by Rare's main brain, the Stamper Brothers, the game is clearly in the same spiritual ballpark, and is standing just about behind the line of being retro enough for having a good nostalgic triplet.